Thank you. The, the world of Zoom, hybrid lectures. I teach at Boston University one night a week. And one year during COVID, I met none of my students. So when I would ask, is anybody questioning? Do you have any questions in regards to what we've done? Nobody said a word. They were eating, sleeping, walking the dog. But at the end of the course, they did really quite well. I was very pleased. But I use a lot of these lectures in my teaching because in some ways, many of us remember shopping in downtown Boston. But the lecture on molasses that she spoke about and the lecture on the other red line are still lectures on Boston history. And whether it's actually the vaudeville and strip clubs or something such as the molasses tank of 1919, they're impactive in our lives today. Well, this lecture is actually about how people went to town. In town was the place to go. I'm sure Osterville Village actually had wonderful stores, but if you wanted a variety of things, you would actually go into Boston where there were upwards of 20 different department stores. And seen here at the corner of Tremont and Winter Streets, from the 1950s, you realize that these small shops, including Dorothy Muriel's, Brigham's, and also Havian Chocolates, was a major attraction. Well, Boston during this period, now I'm going to actually hope that word. Oh, there it is. Boston in the 19th century was to grow tremendously. Boston had been settled as a town in 1630. And by the period of 1801, when this was actually painted, the old state house was in the center of the north end on the right and the south end on the left. State Street, which had once been King Street prior to the revolution, was actually a town built of wood. And it would be changed in a way by Charles Bullfinch. He would actually build a city of red brick. And during the period between 1800 and 1820, when he left for Washington, DC, Bullfinch transformed the city of Boston. And in that instance, we would see that one of his first commissions was the Tontine Crescent. This was a pavilion with eight row houses on either side. Today, it's known as Franklin Street. But during that period, it was the epitome of sophistication. He introduced neoclassicism, a form of architecture we call federal architecture. And in this way, the buildings built of red brick were painted gray to emulate Portland stone of the Bath Crescent. Now, in this instance, Bullfinch himself was not just somebody who began this aspect of neoclassical architecture, but he built in this instance the first connected houses in all of New England. Seen in the center was a pavilion with the Boston Library Society on the second floor that would later join with the Boston Athenaeum. And in the attic was the headquarters of the Massachusetts Historical Society. But do you see the archway on the ground floor level? That would lead through to Summer Street and gave its name to Arch Street in downtown Boston. Well, Bullfinch during that period would see the South End, as it was then known, now Downtown Crossing, was a residential enclave along with its places of worship. Seen here at Summer and Bedford Streets, was called Church Green. The octagonal church was a Unitarian church built in 1819, but demolished by 1855, as its residents would move to Beacon Hill in the Back Bay. But this whole concept was that Bullfinch was also somebody who would do land development. Seen here is John Hancock's house. It was just to the left of the Massachusetts State House. And John Hancock, previously his uncle, Thomas Hancock, owned much of the land on Beacon Hill. During the period of the early 19th century, Bullfinch would develop this for the Mount Vernon proprietors, creating in some instances, not just a new residential area, but he cut down Beacon Hill, which rose to the height of the Massachusetts State House Dome, carted it down Mount Vernon Street and created the flat of Beacon Hill. So the area between Charles Street and the Charles River, now used as Starro Drive, is a great example in this instance of topographical changes. And here at the corner of what is today Beacon Street and Park Street, we not only see the Park Street Church in the distance, but also the row houses, almost every one of which was designed by Charles Bullfinch. He built on Park Street, Tremont Street, Boylston Street, and Beacon Street. And in that instance, he transformed the city. 
But Boston by the 1850s and 1860s was changing from a residential to a commercial aspect. And seen here in a wonderful photograph of 1860, this is Boston as the eagle and the wild goose see it. And it was a detail of a photograph taken by James Wallace Black in 1860 from Samuel King's hot air balloon that was known as the queen of the air. In 1863, Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote in the Atlantic Monthly, Boston, as the eagle and wild goose see it, is a very different object from the same place as the solid citizen looks up at its eaves and chimneys. And if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see the spire of the Old South Meeting House. And if you follow at 45 degree angle, the crenellated tower of Trinity Church, now the site of the Filene Building. But Boston, seen here on Washington Street across from School Street, was a good example of how once residential houses had now been convert converted to commercialism. And we see a variety of places from printing and engraving and carpets. This was something that we would realize that by the period of 1860, almost all of downtown had changed. And in that way, even the Tontine Crescent that I just mentioned mm -hmm. was something that would actually here be rebuilt in 1859. Franklin Street, looking towards Washington Street, was the epitome of Boston's growth in the mid-19th century and was a proud manifestation of the city's architectural and mercantile achievements. Gridley J. Fox Bryant was an architect who built in granite what his father Gridley Bryant had quarried in Quincy. So the city had changed dramatically, and as buildings were demolished, including the Cathedral of the Holy Cross, which had moved to Boston South End, a new building was built on its site called the Cathedral Building. This was designed by Joseph Billings, and of course built on the site of the old church that had been designed by Bullfinch in 1803. It was established by Jean Lefebvre de Chevres, the first Catholic Bishop of Boston, and when Pope Pius VII created the Diocese of Boston, the church was elevated to a cathedral. And the building proved too small for the city's increasing Catholic population and was enlarged in 1825. And the last mass was set in 1816 and the church was demolished in 1862. Well, the cathedral building was owned by Patrick Donahue. He didn't even just have this as a commercial space. He printed the pilot there which I'm sure we all read every Friday, <laughs> as well as the Emigrant Savings Bank. So in this instance, the area would change from a residential to commercial one, but it would also change in 1872. In that year in November, there was a fire that would destroy 65 acres of downtown Boston, and it started in this building owned by Seaman Kluse, a very wealthy German immigrant. It was built in 1869, he rented it to a variety of different shops, but it was a hoop skirt factory, which actually caused the fire. A spark from the furnace ignited a bale of cotton, and the building was engulfed in flames, and within a half an hour, the entire block between Kingston Street and Bedford Street on Summer Street was engulfed in flames. And seeing here the Great Boston Fire was something that had what was said at the time to be the modern day equivalent of an $18 billion loss. Seen on the waterfront with excursion boats in the harbor itself as people paid a dollar to watch Boston burn, we realized that Courier and Ives would create this wonderful uh, lithograph. And here again was the cathedral building. Again, because it was something that the pilot had been printed, we realized that many of its chemicals and wooden trays for the type would ignite and burn within minutes. Well, downtown Boston was completely destroyed. And seen here from the corner of what is today Washington and Summer Street, you began to see that this 65 acres was not just the manifestation in some ways of what would become the new Boston, but it was something that eradicated any aspects of residential development and of course the commercial rebuilding. Well, in that instance, we realized that even Trinity Church seen on the right-hand side had been built in 1828 and today the site of Filene's, this area itself would see tremendous destruction. On the left-hand side was Hovey and Company, a company that would be absorbed in 1925 into Jordan Marsh and Shreve Crump and Lowe. 
So the downtown district had changed. And what was rebuilt in 1873 was a new city. Seen here from Church Green, Bedford Street on the left-hand side and Summer Street directly ahead, George Clough, the first city architect of the city of Boston, would transform the downtown district. No longer was it called the South End. The new South End had been developed in the late 1850s and 1860s. This became the downtown district. These were five and six story structures. Now, of course, built of either granite, marble, limestone, or brick. And they also had party walls and firewalls and the buildings themselves were the ideal for Boston's continued growth. George Clough was a major architect, and though he was in private practice, he did serve as a city architect between 1873 and 1878. And any building in the city of Boston, such as a library, a municipal building, a police station, or a fire department building, would all be designed by him. What happened was that the downtown district, as we see here on the right-hand side, on Washington Street between the Old South Church and what is today Summer Street on the right was a variety of buildings, not only cohesive in their late 19th century architecture, but with a variety of businesses. If you look, you see a pool hall, a bowling saloon, and of course, all these different shops along Washington Street, including Raymond's, one of the major department stores that we're gonna be discussing. Boston itself was changing. And by 1870, Boston only had a population of 250,000 people, of which one half were either immigrants or the children of immigrants. Boston, in this instance, would swell tremendously. And as the city continued to expand, not just by rebuilding, but also annexation of surrounding cities and towns, the city of Roxbury became a part of Boston in 1868, the town of Dorchester in 1870, the town of Brighton, which included Alston in 1874, and the town of West Roxbury, which actually was to include Roslindale, as well as, of course, uh, West Roxbury in 1874. And we realized that the city of Charlestown in 1873. By 1900, Boston's metropolis would include over a million people, and everyone seemed to go in town. Well, here is Washington Street with Avery Street on the left-hand side with R.H. White Department Store on the right. Now, you could get into Boston by simply walking or taking a streetcar, as you see here, and these streetcars connected all parts of the city, as, including the suburbs, and Boston in that instance would have wonderful stores that had a variety of things. A department store represented various departments under one roof. So you might have men's clothing, women's clothing, children's clothing, household goods, oriental rugs, gloves, a variety of things. And today's lecture deals with some of these different department stores. Well, this was Abraham Schumann Company and was a wholesale clothier at Summer and Washington Street. And this building later became the entrance to Jordan Marsh's men's department in 1922. Schumann was a major company that moved into Boston from Roxbury. Abraham Schumann, a German Jew who had immigrated to Boston in 1849, was somebody who was very successful in the time of the Civil War. And when he moved to Boston in 1875, he created a Schumann and Company. And seen on the left-hand side, he provided suits for gentlemen. Now, they had ready-made suits, which was a novelty at the time, and you might pay $12 to $20. Sounds great to me. But they also had to order prices where a tailor would actually measure you and prepare them, and you would get it back in six to eight weeks. In that instance, ready-made suits were something that were not only novel, but you could actually have them in less than a day. Usually it was cuffs and trousers that would be tailored, but the wholesale clothier was something that made this man a fortune. And in the late 19th century, we began to realize in some instances that these department stores were offering a variety of goods as well as a variety of services. Does anybody remember Raymond's? Mm -hmm. So you probably remember Uncle Eve, who was actually the wonderful 
trademark of that store. Raymond's was where you bought the hat, and he always misspelled everything and spoke as a swamp Yankee. Mm -hmm. Opened in 1872 by George Raymond, the store was located at the corner of Washington and Franklin Streets. Well, Raymond's was a little bit less than most of the other department stores. They also had remainders. They had wooden bins that had a variety of things. And every oriental rug in my house came from Raymond's. And they're three generations down. But seen here, he was actually quite a well-known man. Raymond's had the venerable Yankee Uncle Eve and Aunt Abby, and it's a well-known spokespersons that created one of the more outlandish and unique of all the Boston stores. Uncle Eve of the whisked top-hatted swamp Yankee with an eye for a bargain and a problem with spelling. Every year with much fanfare and advanced publicity, Uncle Arif, Uncle Eve arrived at South Station and was led to the store by a marching band to celebrate Oragasham Day, the anniversary of the opening of the store. Not for Uncle Eve, but he came in a tumbro cart led by two yoked oxen. And you can imagine Boston in the 1950s actually seeing this on the street. But there was also Jordan Marsh. And seen here at the turn of the 20th century, this was not just the largest department store in New England, but it also offered unrivaled services to its shoppers and those who had store charges. And with an unheard of money back guarantee, if one was not pleased with their purchase, this policy in and of itself was to secure a loyal clientele who patronized the store. Actually, the store was quoted as promising perfect satisfaction would be given or the money would be refunded. Well, Jordan Marsh was probably not only the largest, but one of the oldest. It had been founded in 1851 by Eben Dyer Jordan and Benjamin Lloyd Marsh. And these two dry good merchants met in 1841 when they had rival stores on Hanover Street in Boston's North End. They did quite well for a decade, but in 1851 joined forces to create a department store that went the gamut. And in that instance, by the period of 1950, began to expand to the suburbs. We realized in some ways that Jordan Marsh, seen here at the corner of Washington and Avon Place, was a magnificent structure designed by Nathaniel Bradley. He may not be a familiar name, but Bradley was the man that created the prototype of the South End Row House, red brick, swell bay facade row houses that actually created a streetscape. And he also designed the Baker Chocolate Factories. This building called the Clock Tower was built in 1884, and it not only had huge windows on the second and third stories, but it was there that live mannequins would actually display the latest fashion for the pedestrians crossing the street. And in that instance, seen here, the new Jordan Marsh department store created great attention in Boston. And in an article published in 1884 in the Boston Post, it was said that Jordan Marsh and Company now had the finest and most colossal store the world ever saw, surpassing by far anything that had been attempted, either in New York or Philadelphia up to that time. And you can see here again, streetcars, but even though it is the shopping hour, it was really the lunch hour. So we have shoppers, people on their lunch hour, and of course, people running to meetings. But on the upper left-hand side is a bronze tablet, unfortunately lost. And it said that this is the busiest corner on Boston's busiest street. By the turn of the century, one would see town as burgeoning six days a week. And Eben Dyer Jordan Jr., son of Eben Jordan, who actually would give the business to his son in 1894, revolutionized the service. He created a charge token. Today, we have a charge card. But Jordan Marsh was the first of the department stores to extend credit, $25. I mean, imagine today. But this charge token would actually have, as you see, JM and Co. On the obverse would be a number assigned to you. And you might charge your purchase so that allowed the middle class to purchase a living room set or a dining room set or maybe a rug. And in that way, if you paid it over six months, there was no interest. 
after the six month, 1.5% compounded monthly. And in that instance, it did change Boston. But we also realized that by 1949, looking towards their 100th anniversary in 1951, Jordan Marsh and Company, then under the Mitten family, would expand with a new structure at the corner of Chauncey and Summer Streets. This was designed by Perry Shaw and Hepburn, a very well-known architectural firm. They actually have a claim to fame that they just redesigned and restored Colonial Williamsburg for the Rockefeller family in Virginia. But this building was something that had not only central air conditioning, electricity, as well as escalators and elevators, but it even had radiant heat sidewalks. So there was no reason not to shop at Jordan Marsh. And of course, we all know that during the period of the late 1950s, they would create something that was not only marveled at, but on that parapet directly above the plate glass display windows, they would actually have a life-size nativity crash. Now, in this instance, it was something that we realized there were figures of Joseph, Mary, and the baby Jesus, shepherds with their sheep, the three wise men riding camels, and three-dimensional palm trees. And with twinkling electric stars and recorded holiday music, choppers were put into the holiday mood. As I came up from the escalator from the um, underground subway, I would always marvel and I would say, did they have palm trees in Jerusalem? Mind you, I was five years old. But the whole idea was it was creating something partly because the holiday season was when these businesses earned 35% of their overall average annual income between the day after Thanksgiving and little Christmas. And of course, you might remember the enchanted village of St. Nicholas. This was something that was started in 1959. Edward Mitten, who was basically the third of the Mittens to be president of Jordan Marsh, commissioned Hans Hoffman, a well-known toy maker in West Coburg, Germany, to actually create a village that actually was three quarters in scale with 24 different tableaus, along with over 250 automatons, men, women, and children, as well as animals. And this was something that was a gift to the people of Boston. Many people don't realize they actually sponsored a Thanksgiving Day parade in Boston. And Jordan Marsh would run that from 1929 until 1943. I always thought it was only Macy's. But Jordan Marsh, after the war, decided they would do this. And as you see here, there was a walkway with stanchions that allowed you to look into these individual tableaus. And seen here, the enchanted village of St. Nicholas was said to be a mixture of Tudor revival and Storybrook style, with half timbering and mullion windows that mimic medieval cottages and English country houses. Here, animated figures of cows, bulls, and sheep peer from a wooden shed as they move in unison to create a fascinating glimpse into a depiction of 19th century village life. This was said on the day it opened, on the day after Thanksgiving 1959, to have 30,000 people waiting. And that first year had over 275,000 visitors. Of course, it was on the top floor of the annex and you had to take the escalator, the elevators weren't available, because when you left, every level of the building had sales, so that as you saw it, maybe you too would make a purchase. But the attraction was too much. Seen here, a Hans Christian Hoffman built glass blower on the left in the ornament shop in the Enchanted Village of St. Nicholas, was photographed by Look Magazine in December 1959 with three children admiring the multicolored ornaments, which are of blown glass and decorated with traditional Bavarian designs. These were children of the employees of Jordan Marsh, and it created a wonderful aspect. This automaton figure, if he could, would blow these wonderful ornaments, many of which look what we had on our tree in Dorchester as a child. But the whole aspect was, if you liked them, they were available in the Christmas gift shop mm -hmm. on the way out. And children peer through the window into the bakery, where they watched the baker making German-inspired cookies. 
They and their parents were equally charmed by the automated figures and attention to detail, as it really was intended to be a village. Even automated cows, horses, dogs, and sheep were part of the enchanted village of St. Nicholas. And though the baker would try to lift these trays of cookies, these two little girls in their pinafores looked through the window, and these cookies were not only made with Germanic recipes that were in that Look Magazine article, but they too were available in the bakery on the way out. Well, Jordan Marsh would actually see this as a great attraction. It brought millions of people over the years. Later in 1980, new automated figures were made, and they are the ones that Tom Menino, then mayor of Boston, erected on Boston Common. They were sold at auction by Sonia Payne Auctioneers and Jordan Furniture, not to be compared with Jordan Marsh, <laughs> would erect it in Avon. And again, now what we had seen with our grandparents, we can show our grandchildren. So it's a tradition in Boston that is something that was a major part of the advertising and marketing of Jordan Marsh. And you might remember the Jordan Marsh blueberry muffins. Yeah. Heaven forbid when you got to the bakery and there were no muffins left, you would take your little token, which was a small paper uh, coupon, and wait in line and realize in some ways that only things left were the fruit muffins or maybe brownies. John Pupik, as you can see here, was one of 24 bakers. So a department store is not just a place to buy clothing. It also had a bakery. They had luggage repair, a cobbler. How many of us go to a cobbler? I do. But these were things that in some ways people I had the idea that they offered. Well, by 1930, people dressed to go to town. And seen here, every woman has a beautiful coat with fur. Men wear hats, which was unusual. But seen here at the corner of Washington and Summer Street, it wasn't just during the holiday season, it was throughout the year. And these department stores, in some ways, really did show wonderful things. Here in a postcard, and this dates to 1910, it says Summer Street from Washington Street. Well, on the right-hand side isn't Jordan Marsh. This is A. Schumann and Company. In 1922, when he died, the company was sold and it was bought by Jordan Marsh. But on the left is Filene's. Now, unlike the other department stores, Filene's was considered a specialty shop. It really was elegant. And if you could withstand the aroma of perfume as you walk through the front door, you would then see a variety of things that were really a cut above. During that period, you realize that A. Schumann and Company was somebody who I mentioned had not only ready-made suits, but tailored suits. And you can see here on the left-hand side, a trade card. This was for a Hammersmith suit. The young boy actually has knickers and a wool jacket. And on the right-hand side, you can actually see wholesale boys clothiers. And these were an important feature for both men and young boys. But the whole idea was, here he was showing indigo blue yacht and French flannel suitings, something that was available to the middle classes. It was still a little bit expensive if you were part of the working poor. But in this instance, he was somebody who started off poor and created something that was quite good. But William Filene and Company was, as I mentioned, a specialty shop. And it was said to be the world's largest specialty store and was started by Wilhelm Katz, seen on the left, who anglicized his name as Katz in German means feline. As a result, he became William Filene instead of Wilhelm Katz. In 1851, he opened a store in Lynn, Massachusetts that would later expand to Boston. The photograph shows him about 1875 and on the lower right-hand side is one of his trade cards, William Filene, 18 Market Street, Lynn, and 10 Winter Street, Boston. In this way, he moved into town as a very successful dry goods merchant. And he rented this building at the corner of Washington and Winter Streets. And it was said that it was the most complete and largest specialty store in the world for ready-to-wear apparel for women, misses, girls, and infants. Not only did it have, as you see, space above, but the corner of the building was really quite important. 
within the year, they decided they would expand. And seen here, built between 1911 and 1912, was the new Filene's specialty shop. Filene's was designed by Chicago architect Daniel Burnham and was built in 1912 at the corner of Washington and Summer Streets. By 1929, Filene's had grown tremendously and would expand its operations by converting the block around Washington, Summer, Hawley, and Franklin Streets into one large specialty store. And Burnham, seen directly below, was not just the architect of the Waldorf in New York, but the Copley Plaza in Boston. This was a major department store. But you realize that Filene said that they were the hub of the universe. And during the 19th century, Oliver Wendell Holmes had written that Boston was the hub of the universe. Well, Filene's took it one step further and had this compass star placed into the walkway as one entered the building. And today it's recently been restored and is still part of the entrance to what is today Filene's, a senior citizen's apartment building. Filene's, by the period of the 1930s and 40s, as you see on the left-hand side, didn't just have beauty salons, but it also had children's sanitary barber shops. And directly below were the perfume counters, a variety of different scents for every liking. But Filene's, too, would offer a charge token. Does anybody remember the charge tokens? My mother had them. They were her mother's, I assume. But this was, again, like Jordan Marsh, a charge token. And whereas Jordan Marsh was the first, Filene's had followed suit and by 1890 was again offering credit to customers. But during that period, Wilhelm Katz or William Filene would retire and his two sons, Edward Filene and Abraham Lincoln Filene, and you get a bonus point if you know for whom he was named, <laughs> established the automatic bargain basement. And that was in 1909 whereby unsold merchandise moved from the floor to the basement as prices were gradually reduced on a set schedule that was prominently displayed on the wall. Edward Filene's influence gave the store an early reputation as a customer-oriented store with slogans like, money back, if not satisfied. As goods remained unsold, they were eventually donated to charity. And seen here was the automatic markdown system. And it was compelling enough to lure shoppers to the basement, including the one on the right, I love her face, <laughs> where everyone was treated equally in their efforts to shop for deals. Many shoppers would play hiding games, pushing desired items that were scheduled for further markdowns between other items, with the intention of returning to the store later to purchase them at their new lower prices. This was my mother. She would find a dress, bring it to the gentleman's top coat section and try to find the largest top coat size 60 to 70 and place the dress under one coat and another coat around it. And if she returned three weeks later, the dress, if it was there, would be three quarters off. If she was successful, there was no living with her. But the idea was she coveted whatever she found. It was a game for some, as often luxury merchandise was offered at drastically reduced prices over a period of weeks. Well, this wasn't just something that women went to. Men would actually come for the suit sale. Annually, they had an $11 suit sale. Now, size 37, 36, and 34, 35, well, I think I was that size when I was at Roxbury Latin. But the idea here was that if people would descend upon Jordan Marsh, they might get a suit for $11, a shirt for a dollar and a tie for 50 cents. And if one worked in an office and was required to dress, it was a wonderful aspect. Filene's basement was a destination and it wasn't just Bostonians. Many people visiting the city had heard of the wonderful bargains and usually Filene's basement was on their itinerary when they visited. And seen here, the automatic men's department store would actually have the automatic bargain basement on the left. And this is from 1947. And again, you realized how many people would actually come. Well, not everybody dressed to go to Filene's basement. You might dress going to town, but the idea was this woman obviously had some sort of a gala event that evening. 
And her curlers, which were probably larger than a hot dog roll, would actually make a coiffeur that she could actually be proud of. In the foreground, she's going through all sorts of undergarments. I won't go into it. But Filene's basement also printed their own money. And this was the Filene's automated bargain basement coupon. And this was for a dollar. And it was not valid after 1990. Well, a dollar doesn't sound like an awful lot, but they had dollar days, both at Jordan Marsh and Filene's. And you might be surprised. For a dollar, you might find a pair of shoes, a handbag, gloves. You might find a hat. And in that instance, what bargains you could actually tell people over dinner parties. And of course, seen here, Filene's basement was an example of how one could successfully market and sell surplus or discontinue merchandise from a major department store in a posted automatic markdown policy. People loved it. And you can see in the foreground what it looked like at the end of the day. Everything had to be rearranged and perfect for the next morning. But this was truly something that also would be known as the annual running of the brides. And Filene's basement was often compared to the running of the bulls in Pamplona, Spain. Not to say that a young lady is a bull, but these bulls are let loose on sanctioned off streets in Pamplona as part of a summertime festival. But these brides-to-be, their wedding party and their friends are let loose in Filene's basement. They went with their mothers, their future mother-in-law and their bridal party to actually grab as many wedding gowns as they possibly could. And these gowns were either discontinued or they had been damaged in a fire or water, but you would actually see $10,000 gowns selling for only a couple of hundred dollars. Well, not everybody would go to the dressing room. And it was said that on the running of the brides, one saw more flesh than you did in the combat zone. And this woman, as you can see with her pink bra, actually tries on something as one of her friends holds up a dress and she gives a little bit of a snicker look with her nose. I don't like it. But not everybody liked what they had. This poor girl says in some ways, well, I don't really like it. And she's very graphic with that tongue. Well, it does look a little bit large on her and the lace itself is a bit much, but who knew what you might find? And that was what it was. Eileen's basement was an attraction and people went sometimes every day during the lunch hour or for a few minutes after work. There was also another company called Kennedy's and Kennedy's was a very nice store that provided men's and young boys suits. It was founded in Clary Square in Hyde Park by Frederick J. Kennedy. And Kennedy specialized in men's suits and accessories and would offer to refund the Nickel Street car fare to anyone who came to his department store and made a purchase. On the right-hand side is his store that stood in Clary Square. It's no longer there, but you realized on the left-hand side, this advertisement showed two men in beautiful suits and hats watching a crew member and you realize that the truly well-dressed man looks right wherever he is, whatever he's doing in business or sport. And you realize in this instance, clothes become the man. Well, he moved into town in 1912 and Kennedy's was so successful that this store at the corner of Summer and Holly Streets in downtown Boston went on to become a Boston landmark for men's suits. An early slogan was Kennedy's. Boston's largest, liveliest, leading men's store. Did anybody ever shop at Filene's? Well, when I was a child, it was a destination. I had to wear a blue blazer and gray flannels to the school I went to. And they had a little shop called the Husky Shop. And as this says, what's a little beef between us Huskies? There's a slew of clothes sizes 6 to 22 at Kennedy's Husky Shop. So it didn't just provide suits for gentlemen, it even provided suits for me. And seen here was Conrad and Chandler's on Winter Street. And this was a store that specialized in outfitting women of all ages and sizes, plus had other departments thrown in for good measure. Conrad's and Chandler's had once been independent stores and they joined forces in 1949 
and really became the trademark of a fine store, gloves, handbags, and hats. And you can see Conrad's charge token on the right-hand side. They called themselves that distinctive store on Winter Street. And of course, there was also Gilchrist. This was established in 1842 by George Turnbull, but by the late 19th century, Robert and John Gilchrist had become owners and continued to expand the store so that by the end of the 19th century, it was necessary to see a major expansion. The new Gilchrist department store, seen on the right, was designed by the noted architect Clifton Sturgis and built in 1899. And though not considered as high end as its neighbors, it was a popular and successful store. And during that period, you realize that one of the aspects is even as early as the 1920s and 30s, they began to expand. Well, Gilchrist's store, as you can see here, was a major feature. Washington and Winter, across from Filene's and Jordan Marsh. And as you can see on the right-hand side, they actually had become Retailer of the Year in 1964. They also had shops in Quincy, Brockton, Framingham, Medford, Waltham, Stoneham, Cambridge, and Dorchester. What was the one thing that Gilchrist made that everyone bought? That's right. And the macaroons were a dozen for 70 cents. I'll take a dozen. Well, five reasons why Gilbert's ma uh, Gilchrist's macaroons are perfect. The secret century old French convent recipe. So it was good to eat even during Lent. Pure ingredients, cane sugar, whites of eggs, almond paste made from the finest imported tree ripened olive, uh, almonds. The confectioner's skill result of painstaking training and years of practice. And you realize that these were something that everybody loved, tasty golden almond valentine macaroons. Today, in some instances, some of the stores like R.H. Stearns had started in the 1870s. This was done by Richard Hall Stearns, who was a successful store magnate, philanthropist, and politician whose self-titled department store became one of the largest department chains in Boston and the surrounding suburbs. On the lower right-hand side is what was originally the Masonic Temple on Tremont Street. And after they moved to the further corner of Tremont and Boylston Street, this building was converted by Stearns into a department store and later replaced with a much larger department store as we see here. Mm -hmm. R.H. Stearns and company became a fixture in the downtown Boston shopping scene for over a century and also opened a few branch stores in the greater Boston area. The store catered to the carriage trade, a term used for well-to-do shoppers and customers, and was particularly noted for its women's clothing. The stereotypical Stearns customer being a white-gloved older woman of subdued upper crust demeanor, although well-crafted children's items were also sold, as well as men's clothing, silver, and crystal, but not appliances. You also realize that there was C. Crawford Hollage, Crawford Hollage had started in Milton Village and he would move into Boston by the period of 1910. This was an upscale women's clothing store in Boston with clothing that displayed a distinctive style in the early 20th century. And started by Clarence Crawford Hollage, it was renowned for its red carpet customer service and the fact with a prearranged appointment one could have a personal shopper who would select items for a customer and help with fittings, as well as accessories and jewelry. It was on the opposite co corner from R.H. Stearns. And of course, seen here in an advertisement of the 1940s with their charge token, these were things in some ways that was something that was quite impressive. It says it was destined to create interest under your winter furs. <laughs> Lovely. Leopold Borson Company. This was actually at Adams Square, now the site of Boston City Hall Plaza. And Leopold Morse's department store was an enormous structure. And we realized it was started by a man like Abraham Schumann, who had come in 1848 as a German Jew. Leopold Morse was one of the largest retailers of ready-made suits in New England, which was a burgeoning business in the 19th century. In 1889, because of his great wealth, 
Morse founded the Boston Home for Aged and Infirm Hebrews in Orphanage, which was located in Milton, and the Morse Home, which was at the corner of the former Cornell Austin House that stood on Mattapan Street, now the Blue Hills Parkway, near Mattapan Square. Later, it moved to American Legion Highway and became known as Hecht House in Dorchester. But he was a major department dealer. Seen here at the turn of 1910 to 1911, Leopold Morrison Company on Brattle Street in the old West End of Boston, now the site of City Hall and the Plaza. And Kresge's. I'm sure we all went to Kresge's. Yeah. But in a lot of ways, this building on Tremont Street was something that was a little bit tawdry in some instances. It was started by Sebastian Spearing Kresge, and he began S.S. Kresge as a chain store in 1897. And the surprising thing is it would later morph into Kmart. I never knew that. And in that instance, you realize that some of these smaller stores mm -hmm. were equally successful as the big department stores. Well, seen here in the 1950s, Washington Street, and we're looking from Avery Street to the area of Gilchrist, you began to see a variety of shops. There was Hudson's, Lerner's Shoes, Albert's Hoseries, Mary Jean's Dresses, Gilchrist, and on the right-hand side, Jordan Marsh. And here, a little further up, you had Gilchrist on the left-hand side, E.M. Lowe's, I.J. Fox Furriers, W.T. Grant, and on the right-hand side, Filene's department store. This whole aspect of downtown was something that was incredible. Granted, there were large stores, but there were also specialty shops. And here in the 1960s, on the right would be Arch Street, and on the left, Chauncey Street. We're looking towards Gilchrist in the center, Filene's, Kennedy's, Long's Jeweler, Crosby Shoes, and a Waldorf cafeteria. Jordan Marsh is on the left. Boston had evolved since 1872 when 65 acres in downtown Boston was destroyed. But in the 20th century, this was the destination when people wanted to do specialty shopping in town. And it was something in some ways that had a variety of goods. And here, Bond's Clothing, something that was a very prevalent store with areas throughout the city, was something that would attract people. It's now a CVS. What is it, a CVS? And we see on the right-hand side the Charlestown Savings Bank that would later morph into the State Street Bank and Trust. Boston changed. And in that period, we realized that not everybody was going into Boston. And by the period of the 1990s and the early 21st century, the suburban shopping malls really supplanted, in some ways, shopping in downtown Boston. Some places which were really quite well known. I don't know if anybody knew Albert's Hosiery, but my mother bought her nylons there and she'd buy a dozen at a time and we'd have to sit there as she chose different colors and things of that sort. And you realize that not only had an official loans directly above, probably needed to take a loan to buy all the nylon she brought home, but you had specialty shops on either side. So downtown Boston truly was something that brought people of all walks of life. And seen here, it wasn't just women and men, but even a priest. Yeah. So it was a great example in some ways of going to town for shopping. If you were like me, and I was raised Roman Catholic, we always stopped at the Arch Street Shrine. I don't know how much I'd sin from one week to the next, but it was something that I always would actually say my act of contrition and wait to actually confess my sins. Well, the architect of St. Anthony's Shrine was a friar of the province, Brother Kajitan Bauman. The shrine had served as a residence and workers of Boston since its completion in 1955, and the community is driven by its dedication to the mission of welcoming all people through prayer and outreach. And this truly became the chapel of the workers. So during that period, people looked at shopping as something that wasn't just enjoyable, but really quite necessary. We did not have Amazon when they arrived the next day, even though you had placed the order at 9 p.m. the day before. Seen here at the corner of Tremont and Winter Streets, a photograph we started with, we realized that it went the gamut from small specialty shops, restaurants, candy shops, 
and the great department stores. In some ways, this is a book that will be probably done in 2026, but I try to make in Boston, and there are many more stores, by the way, make it into something that is a little bit more understanding of when we went to Boston in an area which was 10 square blocks, we would find everything we could possibly need. Thank you, I hope you enjoy. So does anybody have any questions or comments? Please. I do in many of my lectures, but the thing was, I thought we'd get out of here by two o'clock. Bailey's was another destination. If you were a good boy or good girl, you would go to Bailey's. Well, I was always a very good boy, but we didn't always go to Bailey's. Does everybody remember Bailey's? You could choose your ice cream, butterscotch or fudge sauce with marshmallow, and the attached plate to the little cup was something that was incredible. It was really quite a wonderful memory. Please. Uh, I got a couple. Um, the uh, cathedral building that really was used for the church, but it doesn't look like a church. No, the cathedral building replaced the Church of oh, the Holy okay. Cross that, that became the Cathedral of the Holy Cross. No, that was the building that Patrick Donahue pr printed the pilot, and on the ground floor was the Emigrant Savings Bank. Oh, it, that, and that all was after the current cathedral was built. Correct. The cathedral sold the property and moved to the south end. And the, uh, Schumann said he was a wholesaler, but his ads looked like he was selling retail. He was selling retail. Okay. He also did wholesale, which was probably the biggest part of his business. Okay. The retail was probably less than 50%. Right. And uh, it, it's, you know, as a resident of Boston these days, as you know, Anthony, <laughs> um, it, we were very white. <laughs> oh, very much so. But Boston did have a very mixed audience. There were many Italians. I became white when I went to college. I used to think in some ways ethnic groups were never really considered part of Boston until the 1930s and 1940s. Yes, there aren't many African Americans or Asian Americans. Don't forget, Boston's Asian community was so small until the period of the 1960s that it was contained within four blocks in what was called Chinatown. Today, the Asian population has grown tremendously. Of course, the African-American was a presence in Boston in the 17th century, but in the 19th and 20th century, there was a huge community on Beacon Hill, the South End, Roxbury, and eventually Dorchester and Mattapan. Any other questions? Oh, come on, just one. <laughs> Please. Not much question, but just a comment. Firstly, I highlight my trip I brought a book called Jordan Marsh, and there are pictures of the train sets in there. I don't know if anybody remembered, but the, the room was bigger than this, and they would have train sets constantly going from the time Jordan Marsh opened until it closed. It was called Toyland. You could imagine the variety of things. So my baptismal present from my godfather was an American flyer seven piece railroad set, which I still have. It's an antique now. Yeah. Probably it'll pay for my nursing home, who knows? <laughs> but I think sometimes children remember that. Some people remember Bailey's ice cream, you remember the toy set, but I bet everyone here remembers something about town if you were raised within the area. Any other, please go. Totally insignificant, but there was a little ice cream. I think it was um, the soft serve with special toppings on the step, the upper floor of Filene's basement. There were two floors of this. Yes. And that was one of the things we were bribed with the people back <laughs> or Bailey's to make the trip into town and wait while my mother did all that shop. But each of these department stores also had dining rooms. Filene's had a dining room on the ninth floor. Jordan Marsh had the Red Lantern, which was in the annex. So I think a lot of times people were really well served in the city. Well, I did bring a few books. They're all twenty dollars, and they go the gamut from the Great Boston Fire of eighteen seventy two to Baker Chocolate, and of course Jordan Marsh. Thank you for coming and supporting the library.